Hello, welcome to another Cleve Tech Tech Tip. Is this the fastest Formula One in the world? Well, it depends on your definition of fastest, but maybe this is the one you've all been waiting for. We're going to reveal what I raced in Formula One at the World Slot Car Championships in Latvia. If this is the first Tech Tip you're watching about the World Championships, then maybe you need to go back and have a look at some of the others. I'm gonna put a link on the screen up here. You can look at all my playlist about the 2022 World Championships. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but if you have been following this series, you will have seen me race a JK43 production car in the team race with Gavin Wheels, and also we've had 132nd scale Eurosport class as well. So I'm not going to spoil the results, but you can go back and watch those videos if you haven't done so already. But today we're moving on to the Formula One class, which was the third class at the World Championships. So let's take a look. Before I reveal the chassis and the motor combination, let's take a look at the body shell. Well, the body shell that you have to use, or you had to use in the ISRA 2022 World Championship, is this Colhosa Mercedes. Now, really nice shell actually, really strong, really durable, pretty good downforce without being too excessive. You can see it hasn't got a lot of reinforcing inside it. I've reinforced the pinholes with a little bit of sail tape I think it's called. There is no Lexan inside this sail tape, it literally is just some sail tape wrapped around. I will put a link in the video description down below of the type of sail tape I use. Uh, you can get it from Amazon um, and it's actually some really good stuff. I have used some stuff in the past that hasn't stuck very well to the body shells but this stuff seems to stick pretty well and I'm pretty happy with it. The other type of tape I've used is some uh, sort of glass fiber, sort of stranded, reinforced packaging tape. Again, I'll put a link in the video description down below where you can get that kind of stuff from Amazon. But I've trimmed it a little bit narrower to make it a little bit lighter, so I'm not using the full width of the tape. And that's about it. The rest of the body is all trimmed off nicely, corners rounded to avoid it from tearing, and nice smooth edges to the body shell. So this is the uh, one of the body shells that I did use. You can see it's nicely rounded at the back as well and cut out. So it's it's fairly flexible on the chassis. Now the rules of Formula One, which I'm going to put on the side of the screen here now, dictate that you have to have uh, scale colour schemes or reasonably scale colour schemes. So from this, can you tell what it is? Well, it's not a Mercedes. Well, I'll let you decide what you think it actually is. But these logos here are in the rules. You have to have the end plate, side plate or side pod logos, and you have to have AirPod logos on the car. And it has to be the general color scheme of the car, hence why it's got this red stripe, which runs around the car like that but it really doesn't need masses amount of detail. But you can end up with a lot of cars racing with very similar uh, paint schemes on them. It also has to have your racing number in at least three different places, and your racing number is your ISRA rank. Now, leading up to 2022, my ISRA rank was 20th in the world, and that was gained from an ISRA championship I did in Italy way back in 2017, and the one I did in the UK in 2019, and there hadn't been one in 2020 or 2021. So I had two counting scores. I'd missed Finland um, in the year in between. So in 2018, it was Finland, so I didn't get any score there. And the world ranking is based off of your uh, the three most recent world championships that have been held and your points scored. So really, I was ranked 20th in the world, with two out of three scores. So I was still pretty happy with my world ranking. So that's the body shell. You know, pretty good condition. No problems there. You are allowed to prepare two body shells. So this was actually one that I used in the final. You can see it's got a little bit more reinforcing on this one. Generally because this one was the one I also practiced with 
um, and I therefore just reinforced it a little bit more. It's seen a little bit more use, this one. So this is actually the winning shell. You can see it's taken a bit of a knock at the front at one stage there, started to tear there where it's hit the guide, but I've taped over that um, just to stop it from tearing anymore. But that is actually the World Championship winning body shell from the World Championships. So this one was prepared ever so slightly differently in that this one had, does have some little squares of Lexan around the pinholes. They're mounted on the inside. I don't know whether you can just about see them in the, ca in the camera here in the picture. And then I've used that strapping tape around instead of the sail tape that I used on the other one. This body was actually prepared before the other one, um, therefore was prepared in a slightly different manner and I thought I'd try something different on the other body shell. So here is my fleet of Formula One cars that I took to the World Championships. You can see I was reasonably well prepared for this class. Now I'd learnt a lot from the warm-up race or the European Championship um, that I raced in back in June. I didn't do so well in that class, I really struggled. Um, I think I qualified ninth and finished ninth in the European Championships and I wasn't very happy with my performance at all in Formula One. So I had to go away, had to do a lot of work on Formula One cars, do a lot of experimenting, a lot of trying out, a lot of testing to try and improve the way my Formula One cars worked and drove until I could find one that I was more happy with. But most of the problem was probably not the chassis issues that I had, it was more motor problems not motor problems, but finding the right motor for the track, finding one that suited the car, gave me the right handling and the right feel on the car that I really wanted. So later on, you're gonna find out what motor I used and what the specs were for that, but you can see what I actually ended up taking with me to the World Championships. So I did take with me this chassis here on the far left. This one here is a Dubic chassis. Um, of around about 2019 kind of era. I also took with me this uh, Hawkey Recheck chassis here, this one here, which was around about 2015. And I actually used this one in the 2015 World Championships in the Czech Republic. Um, I think I ended up something like 24th, 25th, something like that around that year. Can't remember exactly, but it wasn't such a great performance that year in Formula One. I then took with me these three more modern Formula One chassis, again from the Recheck Hawkey stable. Um, we've got this one here, um, which was again around about um, 2019, 2020 maybe, something like that, this version. In fact, all of these are around about the 2020, 2021 kind of time, uh, maybe 2019, depending on when they develop them. But over the course of the last few years, they've done loads of different iterations of Formula One chassis, and there's loads of slightly different versions of them out there. So this was the stable of cars that I took with me, all with slightly different motors in, um, and I had plenty to test there and get on with. Now I have spoken about the format of the World Championships in previous videos, um, but just in case or as a quick reminder, I'm going to put the format on the side of the screen here so you know that there's a, uh, a lengthy practice sessions, there's qualifying, there's heats, there's semis, and then there's finals. So there's quite a lot to get through in the event. So you need to make sure you've got a car that is going to be suitable for the track conditions and how they change throughout the event. So it was actually a really hard decision about which chassis to use um, come race time. Obviously, you can only use one car. You've got to submit one car to technical inspection. And you can see here on the left-hand side how many cars were in, you know, submitted to technical inspection. I think there are over 100 uh, racers and drivers competing in Formula One. So technical inspection does take a little while. And so it's really hard to make that decision. Now, in case you're wondering, this is not the car that I used. But this was really, really close to being the one that I actually used for Formula One. Now, this is actually the very old one from 2015. Now, when the track was gripped up for Formula One, um, just to in, let you know, in between every class, the track is cleaned thoroughly and it's re-gripped before the practice for that class starts and then the grip doesn't change or they don't put any more goop down or clean the track or anything 
during that one class. The, the, the track basically rubbers in and uh, is run um, without changing the track conditions at all. So when the track was gripped up for Formula One, it was really, really sticky. I think they'd put quite a bit of uh, goop down on the track and it was pretty sticky for Formula One. So if you're practicing early on, you're practicing on goop rather than rubber and Formula One cars don't lay the rubber down onto the track anywhere near as quickly as a lot of the other classes because generally the motors aren't so powerful. You know, the cars are not digging in round the corners. They're not uh, squatting down so much on the corners, laying that rubber down onto the track. So tyre wear in Formula One tends to be a lot less than in other classes anyway. So the track doesn't rubber up so quickly. So when I was practicing, this really heavy car here, I mean, it is pretty heavy, but it is only really, really thin lead on top of the pans, but it does just make it reasonably heavy. This heavier car was working very, very nicely. Now, again, after the warm up race in June, I'd gone away and thought my motors are just far too powerful for racing at this sort of, uh, on this sort of track. Um, a lot of our racing in the UK is done on sort of quite tight tracks where you need quite a lot of punch, good top end, good brakes. You need a more sort of punchy type car. Whereas when you're racing at something like an ISRA event around these great big eight lane tracks, then you need something that's a lot more flowing, a lot smoother, uh, something that hasn't quite got the aggressiveness that you might have for a UK uh, type club track. So I went for a much slower motor. So I put a slower armature in uh, this one's actually a 50 turns of 30 gauge in this uh, old Cayman setup. And yes, I had to run it very nearly flat out, but it was really smooth, really nice to drive. It just went round and round very, very easily, this car. And it was a nice one, a nice and easy car to drive. And I nearly chose that for that reason, because it would go round and round and round and not fall off. And to be honest, in Formula One, if you can go round and round and round and not fall off at a reasonable pace, you stand a chance of getting a half decent result. Obviously, if you're not particularly fast, you might not win, but you stand a very good chance of getting a good result because you're not crashing all the time. So this car was really, really close. And this was my second choice for Formula One at the World Championships, but it wasn't quite to be. This one, on the other hand, was still not the one I used. I'm, I'm teasing you, I know, but there is a point to what I'm going through. In that this chassis here is very much like the more modern ones that a lot of the uh, Czech Republic guys were using um, and the current version they sell. It has a steering front end. So you can see it does move a little bit like this. If I can get that in the picture there. So that moves like that at the front end. I think the idea behind that is to generally absorb um, some of the uh, corners. So on corner entry, as the guide get pushed sideways, it just damps that corner entry. Obviously, it also moves the guide pivot slightly to the left and moves more weight sort of over the outside. So the outside wheel is perhaps doing more on corner entry. So it does have some front steering, as I would say. It doesn't wobble. If you look at the chassis close up here, you can see there's, there's not really any up and down movement in the front of this model but some of the ones that they now produce have lots of up and down and sort of like a, uh, a drop arm type effect at the front of the chassis. I'm not convinced that that works very well and I like it to be a bit tighter at the front end like that. Um, the newer versions they do actually have lots of brass around these front parts here to add extra weight and they've moved the outside of the pan forward quite a bit to give more forward bias of the weight because keeping the front end down in a Formula One car, if the front end is planted, then generally you can do quite well, um, but you've still got to have the grip at the back end. Otherwise the back end's all over the show and you don't get the drive down the straights. But the, uh, some of the top guys managed to have some really, really good tires that are really grippy. So putting more weight towards the front of the Formula One car in a grippy conditions on the track can work very nicely. Um, I didn't have one of the new versions, Plus the fact that the new versions with the brass around the front, they're not eligible for BSCRA racing in the UK because we have slightly different rules about chassis detail at the front. But I'll put on the screen uh, a picture of some of the newer versions just so you can see what I've been talking about. But again, this car was pretty reasonable. 
I played around, I pretty much used this as a test car, I would say, with trying different things. You can see there's a little bit of solder here on the pan where I was trying to put on some pan stops on the inside. And I tried sort of all sort of various things with this car here, just to do some experimentation to see how I could change the handling and so on of the car um, whilst I was practicing during the practice sessions. But uh, the motor in this is really, really nice. If ever I needed a second motor, this is going to be my backup motor. It probably was faster than the race motor, but maybe too fast. So that's why it was only going to be a backup motor. But this was my sort of test car, but I didn't actually end up using this one. So what did I actually run? There it is. This is the actual car that I used at the World Championships. So you can see it's, again, the Hawkey Brief Check chassis. Um, it's got the brass at the rear, but no brass around a motor box. It's got a fixed front end, not a steering front end. And so this design, I think, was from around about 2020 kind of time. It's not the newest design at all. But it worked extremely well for me. And it was, on the day, it was the best car that I had in my box to use. And it obviously worked out okay. So as you might have seen in previous videos, that is the qualification there on the right hand side. So that was one minute qualification, fastest lap. And I was over the moon with that, qualifying eighth in Formula One. If you've seen that qualifying list somewhere before, then it was in one of my previous videos, my Eurosport video, where I made a bit of a mistake and I put the wrong qualifying list in the video. So if you haven't seen that video, have a look up there, there's a link to it. But apologies now, I did make a mistake in that video and it was actually pointed out by a world champion that I made a mistake in that one. So thank you very much for that. But moving on, we're gonna take a little bit of closer look at some of the features of this car that I used. So this wouldn't be a tech tip video without some tech tips. So this brass around the back here that you see, this came with the chassis and it was optional. You could either solder it in or you could remove it. So you could run the chassis with or without this brass around the rear end. Now, it seems like on their modern Formula One chassis, the checks are moving more towards lots more weight at the front of their chassis. As I said, it had their, the ones they used had brass around the front. They'd move the, the outer bit of the pan further forward. The front wheels would move further forward as well. There were some minor changes to the chassis in regards to that. But generally, it was a heavier car at the front end. But they had left some steel at the back of the chassis. Now, I don't know whether some people were running lead on top of the steel or not, but... Um, as I say, the, the chassis didn't have a brass bit to go at the back, so they obviously felt the balance of the chassis you know, didn't warrant having brass at the back of the chassis. But this one did have this as an option. And I've done some extensive testing with brass at the back, and or not. And my basic conclusion is, if you're running on quite a tight, twisty track, I don't think the brass helps at the rear end of the chassis very much. I think you want a slightly lighter rear end on the chassis. It helps the car um, turn in better. Uh, I found anyway, with too much weight at the back of the chassis, uh, the turn in the car wasn't so good, the smoothness wasn't so good on tight twisty tracks. But come to a big sweeping track, having that little bit of weight at the rear of the chassis made the rear of the chassis a little bit more predictable. So I use this brass at the back end. You can also see I've used one of my signature lightened gears. And if you want to see how, how I did that and how much difference it makes, have a look at the video up there about lightening your gears. Um, it's quite a bit lighter than a standard gear, and you can see how much material has actually been removed. But this is an SK 30 tooth Formula One gear and on a two millimeter rear axle. Um, great gears here, and it's actually running on a Cohosa five tooth pinion, 1.2 millimeter shaft. And I found that gives me an excellent gear mesh um, and a nice, reliable gear mesh. I'm actually using gears, and I don't know whether you can see from this view here, where the pinion is in line with the centre of the axle. So the centre of the motor shaft is in line with the centre of the axle. Some people use gears that are slightly offset to lower the motor a little bit. And you can see here, looking from underneath, that potentially there is a possibility that the motor could be lowered. You can see where the armature is. It could be lowered through that hole a little bit more to get the centre of gravity of the car lower but I'm not 100% convinced about the reliability of offset gears. I know some people use them and have had great success with them, but I just prefer the totally straight inline gears 
um, I get the best reliability from them, the best mesh, and I'm very happy with that. You can also see around the back end that I've just tacked the brass in. It's not, it wasn't soldered in all the way round. In fact, I was still sort of trying it out in practice, tacking it in, taking it out, trying it on the different lanes, seeing how the car performed, doing some tests. Now, and obviously, you decided to go with the brass in the in the end. But you can also see, again, on this one, there's other solder marks around this back end here that I cleaned up a little bit before I took it to scrutineering, just because I don't like it to be too messy around the uh, solder joints, etc. But I was trying some other things like limiting some pan movement at the rear, limiting some up and down movement of the pans at the rear. I tried all those sorts of things just to see what effect it would have on a large track like that in those grip conditions. Because in the UK, we don't tend to be, get to race on those types of tracks with those type of grip conditions very often. So a little bit of a tech tip there in regards to the weight at the back end of the chassis and the use of these nice lightweight gears and two millimeter axles. You can see I've got a spacer here on the gear as well. That helps uh, just in case one rear wheel was to move uh, slightly uh, or if there was any sort of movement in the back end, it keeps that gear in mesh with that pinion. And it also makes it easy if I had to do a gear change, I can just undo this tire, slide the axle out or undo the tire and the gear, slide the axle out this way, put a new gear in and slide it back in and I can leave that spacer in place. So basically I'd slide the axle out till this gear just about fell off and I could get another gear in, slide it in, and I know the spacing and the gear mesh should be fine for a brand new gear. So I lined up eighth for the top heat. That got me into the top heat, um, starting on a quite a tricky slow lane. But nevertheless, I was in the top heat with the hopefully the eight, eight other seven fastest drivers in the world at that point after qualifying. So I was hoping for an excellent heat, a nice clean heat without any crashes. So you should be able to see from the pictures on the screen uh, the other drivers that I was with in that heat. Um, and it turned out to be a pretty good heat. I drove round, did a nice job, not too many crashes, and got a good result at the end of the heats. That's where we're going to have to leave it. I've surprised myself once again at how much I can talk and how long this video probably is already for the first uh, bit of my Formula One video. But I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please use a thumbs up to say you like this video and then you'll get more notified uh, about any other videos I do and it will tell YouTube that you like my videos. Also, uh, I really appreciate it if you could use the thanks as well. If you want to keep me producing these videos, help me out a little bit. Next year is America. I've got to find some funds for America. So any thanks you can give me would be much appreciated. Um, and I will see you again next time where I have a little bit more look, a little bit of a closer look at the top of the chassis, maybe what's going on at the front end, maybe some other tweaks, some other weighting I've done on the chassis, and ultimately where I finished in Formula One, if you don't know already. See you again next time.